year is 1978. The average median home sale price is $55,700. Oh, if I could have a time machine. So mortgages are small potatoes by Wall Street standards, and Wall Street has absolutely no interest in home mortgages at this time, which is why it's a little weird that Solomon Brothers opens a mortgage securities trading desk on Wall Street in 1978. It's also strange because mortgage securities at this time are illegal in all the three states. It's like they're putting the cart before the horse. And that's what made me take a closer look. And I did a whole video on the genesis of this department. But to summarize, we end up with a bunch of Italian guys from Brooklyn who are more wise guys than Wall Street. And the leader of the department is a man named Louis Ranieri, who was pulled out of the mailroom to work in this department. And then he took it over from his mentor, the guy who gave him this opportunity. He just pushed him right out. So we can see that he has you know, no real sense of fair play. There's not a single college degree working in this department. And none of them are experienced either. So this means the Solomon Brothers has built this mortgage securities trading department out of people who are ignorant of the laws that govern their work and who would be willing to do anything to keep these jobs, including fraud. And that's an important detail because it shows us that Solomon Brothers is eyeing our real estate and mortgage markets with, with bad intentions from day one. Let's face it, they don't have anything good planned. Now mortgages at this time are largely the purview of the savings and loans because that's the only place where Americans can get a 30-year fixed rate loan. It makes them really popular with home buyers, but this would become their Achilles heel because savings and loans had to compete with other banks to attract depositors by offering higher rates of interest on customer accounts. This made them vulnerable to rising interest rates because the mortgages on their books that were locked in for 30 years were at lower interest rates. So during periods of rising interest rates, they could end up paying out more interest than they're taking in from mortgage payments. And this is one reason why they were required to keep a cushion of reserves on hand to protect them from going bust due to rising interest rates. And this system worked. It had been tested between 1973 and 1974 when interest rates peaked at 13%, and they were okay after. But their reserves were a finite resource. If rates went up fast enough, high enough, for long enough, they could, at least in theory, run out of these reserves. And that would mean insolvency. And I believe that it is this vulnerability that Solomon Brothers first recognized and opened their department to exploit. And that Louis Ranieri begins traveling back and forth to Washington in 78 to make this happen, to create a doomsday for the savings and loans. Thrifts survived those rate hikes in 1973 and 74 because, because the Federal Reserve had lifted rates by an eighth or a quarter of a percent at a time. This is how the Fed had always adjusted interest rates. The Fed is very cautious about making changes, so they do slight an eighth to a quarter of a percent at a time and then wait to see how the economy responds to that change. I don't know what month Solomon Brothers opened the mortgage securities trading desk, only that it opened in 1978, but I do know that Louis Ranieri traveled back and forth to Washington many, many times between the years 1978 and 1984, specifically to meet with politicians for the purposes of having laws changed to benefit his department. And in March of 1978, the Federal Reserve Chairman Burns, his term was up, and so it was time for a new Federal Reserve Chairman. He gets replaced by a guy named Bill Miller. At the time, inflation is an issue. So Miller starts to raise interest rates the same way the Federal Reserve has been adjusting rates throughout its history, a quarter to an eighth of a percent at a time. He seemed to be under quite a lot of pressure to raise interest rates aggressively because all of the articles that I read about this time period and about him say that he argued against aggressive rate increases, stating that they would only make inflation worse and would hurt the economy more than they would help it. Bill Miller refuses to give in to this pressure, and history has painted him as a kind of a pussy who wouldn't get the job done. But I think the opposite is true. I think that he was brave and stood up against the pressure that he was getting and stuck to his convictions that modest, moderate adjustments in interest rates are best. After all, this had been the policy of the FOMC and the Federal Reserve throughout its history up until this point. But clearly somebody wants those interest rates hiked aggressively because he then gets put out to pasture. Miller gets a promotion to the Treasury, and he's the only Federal Reserve chairman in history who served less than a four-year term. He was only in, he, he only served a little over a year. I suspect Ranieri is behind this push to aggressively hike interest rates. I believe that he has gotten two members of the FOMC, and I think that he was instrumental in having Miller put out to pasture when he wouldn't play ball and aggressively hike the interest rates. And I think that he was probably instrumental in having Volcker put in. Volcker gets put in in August, and two months later, Volcker and the FOMC decide together that, that they're going to run the Federal Reserve in a whole new way. And this policy change, it's so weird because it's not based on any sound economic theory. It's based on what a bunch of economists think can help shock the economy back into shape by psyching people out. It's very strange. The more moderate and modest rate adjustments to the federal funds rate, in fact, in this meeting where this decision to reform the policy of the Federal Reserve, somebody makes a comment that there's going to be at least a 2% interest rate hike by the end of the year. Now, this is in October. That's a big jump in just two months. Well, it, it actually played out even worse than that. Days after this meeting, Volcker hikes interest rates by a 1.5% at one time. Before the month of October is out, he hikes the federal funds rate again, another 2.5%. So a 4% increase just in the month of October. This is worst case scenario for the savings and loans. The savings and loans start hemorrhaging money in October of 1979 with that 4% hike. Oh, but this isn't the only time he does this to them. 
he ends up lowering the rate and then sharply rising them by like four or five percent at a time and then letting them settle back down and then raising and what it reminds me of because of the effect that it's having on the savings and loans is like a serial killer you know the ones that will like choke somebody to death and then they go give them cpr bring them back to life and so they can kill them again this reminds me so much of that he moves the federal funds rate in october from 11 and percent to 15 and percent then back down to 14 percent and in february of 1980 it jumps another five percent at one time then back down to eight and a half percent by june 1980 and then in december 1980 back up to 20 percent mid april of 1981 then back down to 16 percent and in june of 1981 he pushes the federal funds rate back up again to 21 percent Volcker's rate hikes were not just catastrophic for the savings and loan industry, they also put the economy into deep recession. When he started, inflation was the only problem. These aggressive rate hikes hurt the economy more than they helped, just like Bill Miller said would happen. Coincidentally, in June, the very same month, Volcker pushes the federal funds rate to its highest point in history. The Economic Tax Recovery Act was also proposed to Congress. I think at this point, Ranieri has the Fed in his pocket, and I think he pays a law firm to draft this Economic Recovery Tax Act for Solomon Brothers, and I think then he pays an Illinois senator to introduce it to Congress for him. This senator ends up going to prison in the 90s because he's a piece of shit who abuses the public's trust in him. Ratings of this tax bill was significant assistance for the thrifts, and that it was going to be a 25% tax cut for most Americans. And all the news media outlets parrot this narrative. So this had strong bipartisan support in the House and Senate because the economy was in deep recession and Americans needed a lifeline, and so did the savings and loans. So that's what they told us it was, but it wasn't. This thing hurt the savings and loans. It turned out to just be an accounting trick. There was no real assistance given them. They sold their loans and got them off their books. They would need less reserves, and then they wouldn't be considered insolvent anymore if they could meet their reserve requirement. That's all it was. In the long run, it didn't help them because they had to buy these loans back because mortgage payments were an integral source of revenue for the savings and loans. And there's another issue. In order for the savings and loans to sell their mortgages, they have to find a buyer for them. And apparently, nobody wants to buy them. So Solomon Brothers comes to their rescue. And it's in this desperate state that Congress basically serves them up to Solomon Brothers. We're talking about most mortgage loans in America. A trillion dollars worth of mortgages are up for sale. Solomon Brothers gets to name their price. And then they get to sell them right back. And they get to name their price again. They make billions of dollars they didn't take advantage of it, they would be closed much sooner. So it just prolonged their downfall. It did nothing to actually help them, but they were so desperate. I mean, these are actually people, individuals who are trying to hold on to their jobs too, while they look for a new job or something. But you know, they're trying to keep the doors open for a few more days. So they'll take anything, even though they know this is a bad deal for them. It's almost as if they had a gun held to their head, which in my opinion, makes this a lot like a bank robbery, except it was like a thousand bank robberies in one day. I truly believe that this was a crime and that not only were they allowed to get away with it, our government was complicit at many levels. This was actually the final death blow to the threats because you know, some of them were losing $10 million in one transaction with Solomon Brothers uh, and they were already hemorrhaging money. So this did them no favors. It helped Solomon Brothers for so long. They would never have this money back. That would have been a total lie. And the tax cuts that were promised to Americans that were supposed to be phased in over three years, most of them never ended up happening because as soon as this law passed, someone was already drafting the next bill to back off these tax cuts. See, they just added that to make sure that this law got passed. Solomon Brothers had so much writing on this. They needed it to pass. We know the motive is billions of dollars. But how do we know that they're not just playing smart and proactively responding to things that happened in Washington? Glad you asked. Because as a partnership, Solomon Brothers is not nearly capitalized enough to buy a trillion dollars worth of mortgages when they come up for sale on October 1st. So while Ranieri is busy pulling the levers in Washington, Solomon Brothers is busy planning a major restructuring of their business so that they will be capitalized come October 1st when the fire sale begins. And those geniuses started making moves a whole month before this bill was introduced to Congress. And those moves are a matter of public record. In May, they start working on a deal to spin off a commodities trading firm from its parent company called Fibro, and they close on the deal in early June, a few weeks before this bill is introduced to Congress. In June, the bill is introduced. On July 29th, it passes the House. On July 31st, it passes the Senate. And on July 31st, that evening, Solomon Brothers has an emergency meeting to announce to all the partners that they are merging with Fibro. And it's very cutesy because Fibro is short for Phillip Brothers. So it's going to be the commodities trading firm Phillip Brothers working alongside Solomon Brothers, the investment bank. And they're all going to be working under the umbrella of Fibro. And so it's still running independently. Clear that this is just a strategic move to capitalize them rather than a true merging of two companies. And well, it's sort of obvious that Fibro was spun off specifically for this purpose. And let's just acknowledge how ridiculous it is that a loan officer from North Carolina is breaking this story rather than an investigative reporter from some major media outlet or an investigator from the SEC or the Department of Justice 